Randy Moss and Jerry Bailey with another edition of Racing From Home, joined today by Craig Frabel, CEO, Director of Racing for the Stronic Group. Craig, where are you and how you doing? How are you and your family coping with all this? Well, my family's doing great. Um, <laughs> my daughter's actually on spring break, supposedly, but um, so yesterday she got out of bed at one um, in the afternoon. I thought that was pretty serious uh, effort on her part to sleep in but uh no we're doing fine physically we're just uh you know we're working our way through this like everybody else so are you at del mar right now yeah i've been in del mar uh really non-stop for the last month i my home is here and my uh office is at santa anita but obviously with the stay-at-home orders uh commuting back and forth it's uh, not in the card so i'm living by uh phone conference so something wrong with this picture. Jerry's in front of a palm tree. You're in Del Mar, California. Here in suburban Minneapolis, if you can see out my window, we had seven inches of snow on Sunday. But I, I, I digress from that. Um, professionally. Somehow, somehow I think that was your choice, Randy. I don't know. <laughs> You're right. Although I would like to live in Del Mar or somewhere where there are palm trees right now. So professionally speaking, uh, you're, the, you're the racing director for all of the six Stronic properties that actually have races. The only one of those presently being allowed to operate is Gulfstream Park in South Florida. So in this area of, of restricted travel and all that, how tough is it uh, professionally right now for you? Well, you know, I, I think it's it's tough. Um, I think the, the toughest part is not about me really, it's about the you know, potential human toll on, on all the workers on the backstretch. You know, this is a a, a very closed community. Um, owners don't have just, you know, you worry day in and day out how long that's gonna hold together and, uh, and make sure that, uh, that this ecosystem uh, survives to play another day. So after running races for two weeks without fans at Santa Anita and, and subsequently Golden Gate near San Francisco, you were forced to shut down. So what, what are the, what's the status of, of your efforts to get racing back going? What can you do and what have you done or what can you do in the future to get it back up and running at those two tracks? Well, I think, you know, the, the key to this is, uh, and I do think there's uh, sort of on a more national basis, but also, you know, politically and, and health wise within, you know, California, Western States, elsewhere, people are beginning to look at options for quote reopening the economy. Um, I think the, the good news on that front is that, you know, we were doing it well, we had, uh, uh, I think we were very proactive um, as a company in developing protocols to keep workers safe, to make sure that they were utilizing good social distancing and good hygiene. And, uh, and so I think we put together a really successful program. Um, the unfortunate part was that, you know, I think politicians were looking at um, exponentially increasing numbers of uh, cases. Um, deaths, particularly in New York, although that's not operate, we can make the case that what we were doing uh, was not only good for the, you know, the employees, uh, we, we operated in a, an environment where people's temperatures were being taken every day, there's on-site health clinics uh, to provide services to people, um, and to keep the revenue stream going, to uh, keep that going was, was a highly important thing. So we're going to keep making that case to uh, both the Board of Supervisors in LA County, uh, and then Alameda County where uh, Gold Gate is, and we're gonna make that case to the public health authorities. Um, and hopefully, you know, in the not too distant future, we break through with uh, the ability to continue running. Now, we're not naive to be able to stream. Example, at least, has shown that, uh, that we can keep things going, that uh, racing can uh, attract its fan base through uh, purely digital means and, um, and you know, show how we can do this and keep the public uh, entertained, but also do it responsibly. So on a separate topic, I, I find it interesting and somewhat puzzling that right across the street from Santa Anita is the Arboretum that's operated by Los Angeles County that's still open to the public, while Santa Anita, you know, this is with my fans in the grandstand. But when you, when you make the case to state and, and local authorities that Santa Anita specifically should be allowed to reopen, how much do you emphasize 
how different horse racing is from baseball, basketball, other sports right now that have had to go on hold. Well, I, I think we emphasize uh, that as strongly as we possibly can. And I do think, you know, in terms of understanding that the animals need care, uh, that, you know, the, the morning activities are, quote, an essential business, uh, we've been quite successful. The, uh, I, think, I think people are more concerned with the optics of, uh, of one sport being allowed to operate when others are not, which I think is a mistake. But we're going to have to you know, make the case why we are different. Um, and, and one thing we have emphasized is that the vast majority, I mean, and, and, and I say this in all truthfulness, is not being made up, the vast majority of the people who are involved in whatever happens in the afternoon are already there during the day. Uh, so we're not really uh, ex increasing the level of risk by conducting racing. There's probably, you know, 30 more people there in the afternoon, and those people um, are spread out over you know a property of 160 acres so uh you know we're, we're able because we have an empty grandstand it's pretty easy to put you know stewards and and other officials who have responsibilities for the conduct of live racing at a more than adequate social distance have there been any suspicions that animal rights activists have had some influence on the decision to temporarily shut down san anita right now well, I, I don't think there have been suspicions that they were active in trying to uh, have us uh, shut down. Um, and there were a variety of uh, situations uh, and postings on social media where they were organizing phone calls to supervisors in LA County, uh, Orange County, uh, Alameda County to try and accomplish that. Uh, the extent to which those were a factor in decision-making um, we don't have any direct knowledge of. Uh, those people claimed that they were having that impact and that they had people on the inside. So, I mean, that's sort of a disturbing note. Um, but uh, at this point, we don't have any direct evidence of that. Uh, and, you know, I certainly would hope that the public health officials and politicians understand that uh, there's more than one voice that should be heard uh, in these uh, situations. And, um, and certainly the rights of those 700 workers at Santa Anita factor in as much as four rather loud people who, on the animal rights side of the equation. So, Craig, to your, to your point about the optics, it's a valid point. Uh, but I live down here in South Florida, and we're, we're like 14th. Uh, our state is 14th in the total number of cases. But down here in Broward County, where Gulfstream is located, it's, it's one of the hotter spots in Florida. Yeah, you guys have seemed to do all the right things and been able to keep racing going. Is there a difference in your model here versus what you were doing at Santa Anita, or is it simply just a case of politics in two different areas? Well, I think the models are quite similar, and, and you know we've we've been ever since this started, we've been developing uh, models for how to not only just conduct tr racing but but training as well, um, and. You know, a lot of every time we think of something uh, that can improve things at Gulfstream, we transfer that to Santa Anita or to Pimlico or Laurel. Um, so that's an ongoing process. Uh, you know, what the dynamics are, I think we've had some, you know, good relationships in Florida. Um, and I don't mean that in any nefarious fashion. I think just good communication, uh, a little easier to um, communicate directly. Uh, LA County is a huge, you know, place. And, uh, you know, sometimes, I was, and look, I, I'm sympathetic to people in the public health world that this came upon them uh, in many senses, like it came upon all of us. And, and they, you know, they, I'm sure they've got hundreds of or thousands of businesses explaining to them why they're different. Uh, so I certainly understand, um, you know, that it can be hard to make individualized decisions in this environment. But I, again, I think hopefully we're we're getting past the peak of the crisis point on this, and then people can sort of step back a little bit and say, yeah, that makes sense. Uh, how flexible are the racing commissions in your respective states, Maryland, uh, California? You, you've lost a lot of days already in California. Uh, can, you, can you get new dates, different dates, in order to make up some of these days? Um, you know, that's a bit – in Maryland, you know, we run – year round for the most part. So Maryland's obviously not an issue. Uh, in Florida, um, we haven't lost any dates so far. So that's uh, obviously not an issue either. And we run pretty much year round there as well. 
Uh, California is a little different mix. You know, you got Del Mar um, slotted in from around the 18th of July uh, through Labor Day. And, uh, uh, you know, you can't just go in and elbow somebody out of the way. So, um, you know, that, that all remains to be seen. It seems like eons ago that Churchill Downs came out with the announcement that the, the Derby would be run the first Saturday in September. Uh, what I was kind of curious about was in, you know, light of the Triple Crown was the Stronic Group representing Pimlico and even New York representing the Belmont Stakes. Were you all included in that decision making? Was it a joint decision? Did you know about it? Uh, well, as I said, you know, Churchill Downs is a publicly held company. They have a very serious interest in keeping major business decisions uh, sort of behind closed doors. And, and we understand that. I did get a you know, courtesy update uh, somewhat close to the announcement time um, and some conversations with NBC about what the options might be at that point in time. Uh, but um, no, we weren't a, a, a part of the overall discussion. Churchill needed to do what they needed to do. And, uh, uh, and so we understand that. But, uh, you know, and, and as I said, things change in this viral world now uh, every day. So, you know, the facts that were present at one point changed. You know, now the Olympics are not going to be held. So, you know, that changes things as well. So you referenced this being such a unique year that perhaps uh, history and tradition has to be put on the back burner. I know there are a lot of racing fans that just automatically assumed that once the Derby announced a September 5th date, that then the Preakness would fall in line, the Belmont would fall in line, we'd have a reconstituted triple crown in the fall instead of in the spring. But given all that's going on, are you saying, is, is that unrealistic to expect? You know, it's not unreasonable to expect, but I do think, as I said, you know, there's so many changing factors. It's just things aren't the same. Let's not try to assume that they're going to be the same. Now, but it sounds like given this unusual year, there is a scenario that could transpire where the Preakness, let's say, would be run before the Kentucky Derby. Do you agree with that? Sure. That's, that's a possibility. Okay. Well, thank you very much for taking the time. Uh, stay safe. Yeah, buddy, thank you. Thanks, and listen, guys. Appreciate all the racetracks that are staying open that for these horsemen to train their horses. You guys are doing an incredible job. We appreciate it. Thank you, guys. Stay safe. All right, again, thanks to Craig Fravel of the Stronic Group uh, for joining us on this week's edition of Racing for Home from Home. He had a lot of interesting things to say. Uh, I think the one thing that's going to resonate with racing fans, perhaps more than anything else, Jerry, is what he said about the distinct possibility that the Preakness this year, given these unusual circumstances, will actually be scheduled before the Kentucky Derby. Now, obviously, it's not preferable. It's not what any of us would want to see in a perfect world. But historically, it's obviously not the first time in history that the Preakness has been run before the Kentucky Derby, although you have to go way back in the history books to find those dates when that actually happened. I think this just points out the unusual circumstances that horse racing finds itself in right now. And that's even apart from the Belmont Stakes. Because if the Belmont Stakes were to be scheduled in a, a normal triple crown pattern after the Kentucky Derby, then that obviously opens up a whole other can of worms. Yeah, I, I think my biggest takeaway was what every, every one of us really know is there's no certainty. There's absolutely no idea when racing is going to be open up there or he can't pick a date. So um, on the calendar, it would make sense that Belmont actually might be running before Churchill Downs. I mean, Churchill Downs does have dates that go into July, but who knows whether they'll be running. They've already said the, der the Derby's going to be September. So I can see a scenario where the Belmont runs first, actually. Uh, I don't know if we got to find out about that. I think that's what we're going to endeavor to do in the next show or two is uh, talk to representatives at Belmont Park to see what they have in mind. But yeah, I, I don't think anybody knows where anything is going to land at this point. Well, it's entirely possible right now, for example, that we could have uh, we could have the Preakness in late July or early August. We could have the Kentucky Derby on September the 5th and we could have the Belmont Stakes at the end of September. You know, you could go Preakness, Derby, Belmont. You could go Belmont, Derby, Preakness. But I, I think maybe what some racing fans don't particularly understand fully right now is that if you say, okay, we're going to just move the Triple Crown. Instead of being 
in the spring as originally scheduled. We're just going to take it, lock, stock, and barrel, and we're going to move it to the fall, beginning with the Kentucky Derby on September the 5th. Then that would put the Preakness Stakes on September the 19th, which it wouldn't, wouldn't seem to be a, a major problem, although with TV and NBC, I, yeah, I don't know if that really would, would be necessarily uh, a good date. But then three weeks after that would come the Belmont Stakes in early October, and the Breeders' Cup is scheduled for the first weekend in November at Keeneland. And I think you and I know from experience that right now in thoroughbred racing, a mile and a half in general is an anachronism. A lot of horsemen don't really want to run a mile and a half in June, um, but they do because the Belmont Stakes is, uh, is such a traditional race. And of course, if the Triple Crown's on the line, that's a, that's a whole different uh, ball of wax. But to be four weeks before the Breeders' Cup Classic, uh, you'd have a tough time, I think, convincing horsemen to run a mile and a half in the Belmont Stakes and then come back four weeks later and run a mile and a quarter in the Classic. We'll find this out in the coming weeks, but my sources uh, in New York have told me that unless the Breeders' Cup was moved back at least two weeks and possibly three, that the Belmont probably isn't going to land four weeks out. Uh, to your point, horsemen wouldn't want to do it. I don't think it's optimum for anybody. I think they'd rather run it earlier, if at all. Uh, but look, we, we don't know. We don't know when people are going to be able to, to get back to any kind of normalcy. Um, my, my feeling is whenever these races are going to be run, they're going to be run without spectators, at least this year. Right. Well, it's a changing landscape out there. A lot of balls in the air, a lot of question marks, not just horse racing. You know, is the college football going to run? Is the NFL going to start on schedule or at all? I mean, what about, you know, the NBA, baseball? I mean, there's all these things out there that, uh, that are swirling around, and horse racing is uh, right in that mix. But at least we're fortunate that we've seen in the past we're seeing right now with Gulfstream, Oakland, Tampa Bay Downs as the three so-called major tracks that are still being allowed to operate, that horse racing is a little different than some of the other sports in that theoretically, and we've seen it, it can still operate without fans and actually be a nice diversion and bring some money in. Yeah, you know, like, as you just said, these tracks that are operating right now, and they seem to have been doing it virus-free, are kind of like a mini laboratory of what can be done uh, if you take the proper precautions, at least so far, virus-free. Golf, not just because I'm a big fan, but it seems like something like golf and tennis, thank you, uh, could be other sports where you could successfully distance the participants and do it virus-free. Obviously, no fans involved. Yeah, I have my props. I have a golf ball. I have a football back there on the shelf. I've got a baseball that I actually caught at Camden Yards here somewhere around here. I've got a Jerry Bailey bobblehead doll in case you get a little sassy with me. I can, I can pull it down talk to him instead. Do you yeah. hit the golf ball at the bobblehead? <laughs> <laughs> it would probably go straighter than when I hit the golf ball. So I've noticed your finish line in the background. I'm, I'm always keen on finish lines. I can pick them up pretty quickly. Yeah, yeah. We actually bought that from a company in Saratoga Springs. Very cool. Uh, and it had it shipped, which, you know, that's pretty heavy. So it's, uh, it's, it's very challenging and a little too expensive to have it shipped. But it makes a nice little – yeah, nice little no, – there we go. Nice little prop yeah, in the background. Yeah. Well, listen, I want to thank – Everybody out there viewing this, I hope everybody's still locked down, still virus-free and healthy, and, and we'll see you again next week from Racing From Home. All right. Take care.